Hello and welcome to another edition of Active Living. Today we have our traveling man Joe Johnson here. Joe just took a trip down to uh, down down to uh, Dallas, Dallas Texas, Texas. That's right. And has a lot to tell us about Dallas and an event that took place there a few years ago. Yeah. Joe, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me back. Uh, this trip is a little different than uh, the Hollywood ones that I go to where I visit filming locations. Uh, this was more of a historic trip. Uh, in addition to being a movie buff, I'm a history buff. And one thing that has been on my bucket list for a long time was Dallas, uh, Dealey Plaza, the book depository. Uh, just a few weeks from when we're recording this on November 22nd will be the 60th anniversary of the assassination of JFK. So it was coincidence that uh, the trip worked out uh, this year and uh, at this time of the year, but uh, I was able to commemorate the 60th uh, anniversary with the trip. That was a huge event. I remember it well. Yeah, tell us where you were well, because I wasn't born yet. I was born in 66. <laughs> the assassination happened in 63. Where were you Man, when that it happened? that means I'm real old, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually in the Navy at the time. I was uh, on duty when it happened in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And at the time, I was working for this, uh, this uh, group called SOSIS, SOSIS, which was a underwater detection system for mm -hmm. Soviet submarines. Mm. And when the, uh, w when the event happened, uh, you know, everything went on alert, obviously. It was like everything stopped. Yeah, because nobody knew initially who was behind this. Well, everybody at the time was thinking it was the Russians that had done it, you know, and, the, and it was a real, real big issue. So everything stopped and everything went on full alert and uh, things unfolded after that. But uh, you've got some good information, I understand, about from your trip. Yeah. about a lot of the events that took place it, it, in the places at least where, where these things happened. Yeah, what shocked me is how little of it has changed in 60 years. A lot of it is like tra traveling back in time. Really? Yeah, the uh, first place uh, that I went to, and this is just something I kind of made up on my own. I guess you can organize a tour and visit these uh, historic locations. I just sort of Googled addresses and bounced around from place to place. Right. Of course, the number one stop uh, on my journey was the book depository. So I took a lift from my hotel, gave them the address of the Texas School Book Depository. They dropped me off right at the front entrance. I step out, I look up, and there's that building uh, that you see uh, right here. And it still looks... It looks ex uh, pretty much exactly like it did. There was this decorative facade around the first floor that has since been removed. Uh, that facade had actually prevented employees of the book depository from watching the motorcade route from the first floor. Right. So they either went to above floors or they stepped out in front of the building and watched it. Um, witnesses said that when they first heard the gunshots, they looked up and they saw the, what looked like the barrel of a rifle coming out of the rightmost window on the sixth floor. So it's not the top floor that you see in these photos. Right. The top floor is the seventh floor. So if you go one floor down, all the way to the right, that's where people reported seeing a rifle barrel hanging out of the window. And after the third shot, they saw it slowly retract back really? into the window. And so witnesses started uh, telling police uh, that's where we think the shots came from. And there's a pretty famous story about uh, a police officer was one of the first people to rush in. He met up with the supervisor, and I think his name was Roy Truly. And as they were going up steps, uh, they were headed to the roof for some reason. Okay. And on the way up, they encountered someone and the police officer pulled the weapon and the supervisor said, he's one of our employees, this is Lee Harvey Oswald. Really? The police officer encountered him who didn't look panicked, wasn't out of breath, didn't look like he knew what was going on. And so when the supervisor reassured the police officer that he was one of the employees, they continued on to the roof while Oswald just casually just slipped the, out of the very the entrance that you see here in these photos. Well, he just stepped out and boarded a bus. Now, were you able to get up into the building or is that kind of closed yes. off? No, the, so the sixth floor now is a museum. Oh, they call it? it the sixth floor museum at Dealey Plaza. Okay. And um, I have photos of that. Let's take a look. 
So the top left photo that you see there is what they call the sniper's nest. Right. That's enclosed behind glass so you can't access it, but that's pretty much what the boxes look like on the day of the assassination. He had created sort of a buffer where other employees who might have been up there wouldn't have been able to see him at that window. Okay. And there were some employees who said, oh, I was up there by myself, uh, not realizing that he was tucked down behind uh, that rack of boxes. Uh, he watched the motorcade come up Houston Street and make a sharp left onto Elm Street. And a lot of people question why a sniper wouldn't fire at the motorcade as it was coming toward him. He waited for it to turn and start to move down Elm Street when he took the three shots. Right. Most right. people agree that the first shot missed its target. I saw a documentary that said it may have hit the traffic light, which you see when you're up there, there's a traffic light suspended over Elm Street, okay. and the first shot may have ricocheted off the traffic light. Really? Uh, the second shot hit Kennedy in his back, came out um, below his neck, and then the third shot, which is marked on the pavement, we'll see in a moment, uh, there's a big X in the pavement where the fatal shot took really? place. Yeah. Um, but there are some remarkable artifacts on display in the museum. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's wedding ring, which he removed on Thursday, the night before the assassination. I, apparently he left in a teacup and a wad of money for his wife Marina, who was staying at uh, a woman's house named uh, Ruth Payne, who we'll talk about more in a moment. Right. So he left some stuff behind thinking maybe he wasn't coming back. And, uh, and so the wedding ring uh, eventually ended up in the hands of the museum. They have that on display. You can look right out of the windows. The top right uh, photo shows you the view from the window that's right next to the sniper's right. nest. Right, I see that, see. yeah. Uh, now those trees were a lot smaller in 1963, so they weren't uh, obscuring El Elm Street like they are today. Uh, the gun that you see in the bottom left corner uh, is a replica. They have it on display where they found it. It was kind of hidden in the opposite corner of the sniper's nest. They did find shell casings in the sniper's nest, but the gun was hidden in the opposite corner. This is a replica because the original gun is in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Okay. Okay. Uh, there are a wide assortment of cameras. The cameras that you see in, in the middle bottom photo are all authentic cameras that were used to either film or take photos of the events on that day. Their owners have donated them to the museum. Uh, the one camera that is not original because it is uh, uh, in the National Archives, I brought a replica if you want to pick up the uh, camera on the table. Uh, this is a replica, an exact make and model of the camera that uh, Abraham Zapruder used really? when he filmed the assassination uh, from uh, the Grassy Knoll Dealey Plaza area. The famous Grassy Knoll Exactly. Yeah, right. And he perched himself on a high vantage point. Was in, he was only a dressmaker. It's not like he was a, f a photographer or a journalist, but he had bought this camera. Right. His secretary reminded him that he had it, so he perched himself, had the perfect vantage point, and as he saw the motorcade round uh, the corner to Elm Street, he hit record, and there's a little viewfinder. If you want to look through that viewfinder on the back of the camera, Imagine him looking through that viewfinder. Right. That's what he was looking at. And as he followed the motorcade along Elm Street, directly in front of him is when the shots were fired and he captured the whole thing on film. Wow. Uh, it's pretty gruesome, the, the, the Zapruder film as they call it. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, it, it's hard to stomach because it's pretty graphic. Yeah. Um, but his, his uh, film footage is pretty much the evidence that showed what had transpired on Elm Street that day. And Actually, one of the shots went through Kennedy and hit Connolly. Connolly, right. Yeah, so that was the second shot. They call that the magic bullet. Um, the shot went through his back, exited his throat, hit Connolly. Right. Uh, went through Connolly, hit his wrist and lodged in his thigh. So right. uh, he had, Connolly had a number of, of wounds. Uh, he was the Texas governor at the time, right. correct? Um, and so, yeah, so he survived the shooting, but obviously uh, Kennedy's was fatal. Uh, it was fascinating, uh, on the bottom right photo that you see there is a computer simulation of the motorcade rounding the corner onto Elm Street, and the computer simulation shows you 
uh, the sniper's vantage point and when the shots were fired. Some people claim that the second shot was actually two shots fired simultaneously. They say that one shot hit Connolly and the other, or I should say maybe the third shot, one shot hit Connolly and the other shot hit Kennedy. It was fired from two different angles. That's if you buy into the conspiracy theories. All the theory, conspiracy theories. We'll talk about that. In oh, a man. Yeah. yeah. So let's move out uh, into uh, Dealey Plaza. About how far, how, what, how far was that? distance between the the window and where he got shot it you know when you're there it's all a lot more compact than you would think um i would probably say maybe about the length of a football field maybe yards. less than that from yards. the window to okay. the motorcade i'm really bad at guessing distances but it, it was all very compact when you're there you're you're standing where the x is on the pavement and the book depository is right there yeah. so it wasn't the most difficult shot for someone if you believe it was oswald he was at one point ranked a um a marksman i believe uh, I think that was the yep. title that he yeah, was given. Yeah, in the service. So he was he was actually a, a decent shot. He wasn't, okay. you know, the top rank, but he was above average. Right. And so it wouldn't have been a difficult shot with the scope and the rifle that he had. So I met a couple who was down there for the same reason, and uh, they told me that when they checked into their hotel, they looked out the window, and the photo that you see on the left uh, overlooked Dealey Plaza. They they right. were there to visit Dealey Plaza, and their hotel overlooked Dealey Plaza. And I said, oh, you got to share that photo with me. So that's a photo from their hotel room. But you see the book depository oh, yeah. in the center, uh, Elm Street running right beneath it there. Um, the top right photo, you see the X in the pavement. That's I don't know who put that there. I don't know if the city put that there. Um, but that marks the fatal shot. There are also two more Xs before that. They're almost right on top of each other. And that lends to the conspiracy that two shots may have been fired, fired right. simultaneously. Yeah. And that's what some witnesses claim. Uh, the bottom right shot, one of my goals was to stand where Abraham Zapruder stood with his camera. I brought that camera with me since it was the same make and model. And a couple was nice enough to take some photos of me dressed the part and uh, standing on the concrete wall that Zapruder stood at when he gave us that pretty famous photo of uh, Jackie on the back of the limousine when she's reacting right. to the uh, to what uh, transpired. So I was pretty amazing to stand there and look out over Dealey Plaza and Elm Street and imagine the horrors that the people witnessed that were standing along that it route. It was pretty bad. You're yeah. Right. Yeah, so I would imagine some people suffered from, uh, you know, PTSD from just witnessing that whole thing. So, yeah. so that was my goal, was to stand where Zapruder stood. Now we talked about the infamous grassy knoll. I had to get some shots of the grassy knoll. Uh, there's a second uh, uh, home movie that I don't know if a lot of people are aware of. I believe this is called the Nix film. They were opposite of Zapruder filming right. toward the grassy knoll. Okay. And you can see that uh, a frame from the film above matches my perspective on the bottom. It was right. the same angle. And they actually captured the fatal shot as well. And this that film was scrutinized to look and see if there were any uh, assassins beyond that wall, beyond that uh, wood picket fence. Right. Uh, some people claim that they saw a muzzle flash from behind yeah, the fence. Yeah, puff of smoke and all A lot of, of people smoke, heard yeah. a gunshot, which maybe they didn't account for echoes. They, they said that Dealey Plaza had a tendency to echo. Of course. So there were reports coming from all different directions yeah. of where the shots were fired. And some police officers rushed to that fence uh, but didn't find anybody there. But the conspiracy lingers. Yeah. Um, so I had to go behind the fence. So the bottom right corner of that uh, photo that you see there is me behind the fence where a possible assassin may have stood. And I do have to admit, right in my line of sight is that X in the pavement. And it was a pretty clear vantage point. So okay. if there's any truth to that aspect of the conspiracy theory, it really would have been a, a good place for someone to fire. But it would have been very risky because you're, you, you were out in the open. You're totally you been, exposed, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I took that photo just because of the, uh, the conspiracy theories that are out there. But it was really fascinating to stand there. 
A lot of history so, there. Yeah. <laughs> so after the book depository in Daly Plaza, I thought, what's next? And I found out that within walking distance, less than a mile, uh, is the former Dallas police headquarters where Lee Harvey Oswald was taken when he was captured. He was interrogated. Uh, he was going to be moved from the city jail to the uh, county uh, jail. And they had uh, an armored car waiting in this drive that you see here. And as he was brought down to the loading dock, Jack Ruby famously stepped out and shot Lee Harvey Oswald on live television. So Ironically. I, I was there. I saw it. Uh, where? Where were you? I was in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh -huh. I, didn't, I wasn't at the place, Did you but, see I, it on but TV? I saw it live on TV. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine how shocking that must have been, it was, uh, a, a yeah, live it was, coverage. It was crazy. That's amazing. So ironically, the, the armored truck that was supposed to transfer Oswald uh, blocked the entrance where an ambulance couldn't get in. So they had to get that armored truck out of there, an ambulance backed in. Uh, they loaded Lee Harvey onto the ambulance and took him to Parkland Memorial Hospital where Kennedy died, same, same and he died at the same hospital. And people say, you know, it was, it was one shot. How can that be fatal? But apparently the shot uh, hit several uh, organs and his aorta, and he just wasn't going to walk away from that. Yeah. So, and a lot of people predicted that uh, he, his life was in danger, and sure enough, that those predictions came true. Um, so it was very fascinating. Unfortunately, uh, the building right now is the uh, North Texas uh, uh, Law School, and it's not really open to the public right yeah. now, even though they've preserved the interiors almost as if it's a museum. They allow law school students to have access to it, but not the public. They're thinking of changing that. They're thinking of allowing the public to come in and visit it as a museum. So unfortunately, uh, the only shot I was able to get was the exterior of the, the loading dock where uh, he was supposed to get transported, but well, didn't still. they didn't they pick him up at a movie theater? They did, and we're going to get to ah, that in a second. Go. So the next stop on my little tour, uh, again, I googled. <clears throat> I'm sitting on the steps of the uh, the building there. I'm like, what's next? I I googled the Texas theater where Oswald was uh, captured. And I had to take a lift over to the theater, but it's on Jefferson Street, and there it is. And it still functions as a movie theater. Really? Uh, I was there on a Wednesday. It wasn't open to the public on Wednesday, but they do show movies Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, they say that the, the theater was about ready to close, but when they filmed the movie JFK, they actually used real locations and the money that was paid to the theater by the filmmakers saved the theater and it still operates today. Really? And it is relatively unchanged. Because it was closed to the public, I couldn't get inside, but apparently uh, the interior is unchanged as well. So you can see the seat that Oswald was sitting in when he was really? captured. And he fought with police. He tried to shoot one of the officers, the arresting officers. Uh, obviously, they got into a fight, and he was carted off from the theater and taken yeah. to that uh, the city jail. So amazing to see it uh, relatively unchanged. They say what caught uh, everyone's eye, he was walking down Jefferson Street looking suspicious, and he turned into the theater without buying a ticket. And so somebody who had an eye on him told the ticket taker that someone had just snuck in, when they verified that he had taken a seat in the theater, they called police. So it was a couple of key, key uh, eyewitnesses wow. who put him at the theater, and that's where he was captured. So, I wonder if they realized that who it was when, he, when, when, they, when they called the police. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, now, <laughs> Officer Tippett, J.D. Tippett, had been murdered uh, just a few blocks away. Uh, Oswald was also charged with that killing. So I don't know if the people on Jefferson Street were aware of the police officer killing, but they were looking for the guy who killed Tippett, not necessarily right. the guy who killed the, the president. Okay. So maybe that's what drew attention is uh, the, the police shooting, which was just literally within walking distance from okay. the theater. So wow. Now this was probably the highlight of my trip. Uh, in the top center photo is a sweet woman uh, named uh, Patricia Hall. She is the granddaughter of the woman who owned the boarding house that Oswald was living at when he killed the president. On the day of the assassination, he made his way to the boarding house. There was a housekeeper sitting in the living room watching the news on the TV set. 
She said, somebody shot the president. He kind of ignored her, went into his tiny little room, which you see there on the top right photo. That is Oswald's actual bed that he slept on, which that doorway leads right into the living room. So it's a very small space. Uh, he went in, he retrieved a jacket, his revolver. He had a 38 revolver. He walked out of the front door of the boarding house and uh, encountered Officer Tippett on the way, supposedly shot the police officer and then made his way to the Texas theater. So this woman, Patricia Hall, I said, what memories do you have? She was 11 years old when it happened. Oh, really? Uh, she said, I remember Mr. Lee vividly. Her grandmother owned the house. She would get go there like after school or whatever, wait for her mom to pick her up. Right. Uh, Mr. Lee helped her with her homework. When her brothers were, were fighting on the front lawn, Mr. Lee was sitting on the porch. He got up, he broke up the fight. He said, you two are brothers. You need to love each other. You need to get along. This is Lee Harvey Oswald telling these kids they need to stop fighting and love each other. Really? So she had very fond memories of Mr. Lee and is absolutely convinced that he was set up and railroaded and had nothing to do with it. Really? Yeah. And so a lot of what you see there in these photos, the couch I'm sitting on, dining room table, these are all original artifacts from the time period of when Lee Harvey Oswald uh, lived there. Uh, he lived there for about seven weeks uh, up through the assassination. So the lady, um, did, 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 she didn't have any problem, you know, talking to you about it? No, because uh, her home now is included on a tour that you can take that oh. includes the book depository okay. and this house. I wasn't aware of that. I knocked on the door and walked in and okay. she was happy to sit down and talk really? with me. So That's I fantastic. got real, it was just her and I one-on-one -on -one as she told me these remarkable first-hand accounts of wow. her memories of Lee Harvey Oswald. Amazing. Fascinating, yeah. yeah. And she too, imagine knowing Mr. Lee, a few days later watching TV with her brother, she witnessed the assassination on television. When she heard the name Lee Harvey Oswald, she turned to her mother and said, Mr. Lee's on TV. And as the mother turned and the kids are watching the TV, he Dang. got killed on live television. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So amazing history. I really felt like I was time traveling That's there. That's fantastic. And then the final stop on my tour here is the Ruth Payne house. This is where uh, Lee's wife stayed with uh, their children. Uh, the wife and the children stayed with Ruth Payne, who spoke some Russian and became good friends with Marina Oswald. So Marina and the children stayed at this house while Lee stayed at the boarding house, which was closer to work. Right. He would come and visit the home uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then get a ride into work on Monday from a neighbor. Um, and so everyone was surprised because normally he would come on Fridays. He showed up on the Thursday before the assassination, and they were like, why are you here? Well, look at the bottom right corner photo, even though this is kind of a recreation, in the garage is where he allegedly kept his rifle. Okay. And so he showed up at the house on Thursday, wrapped his rifle in brown paper, similar paper that they used at the book depository, uh, got a ride into work on Friday with the neighbor just a few doors down, and the neighbor testified that Lee had been carrying a package, yep. and they say that that package contained the rifle that he then assembled on the sixth floor and committed his deed. Wow. So, so yeah, so this is another significant location that in some cases you see some original pieces, in other cases they tried to get period accurate pieces, but uh, this is also on the, the uh, Register of Historic Places, and uh, you can also tour this as well. And uh, I, I must have stood there for an hour. It was a tour guide and one other gentleman, and we sat there just talking for at least an hour about really? our theories, our conclusions, that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely fascinating. Um, Today, uh, if you're wondering where the Kennedy limo is today, it's at the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, shockingly, they continued to keep it in use. 
um, for uh, until 1977. So several more uh, wow. presidents yeah. following Kennedy continued to use the same limo, even though they had stripped it, reinforced it, put a roof on it, and put it back in service, which surprises right. me. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then back in 2001, I uh, had a trip to D.C. and I visited JFK's Eternal Flame, which is at Arlington National Cemetery. So right. that's where he was taken. And uh, so that kind of brings the whole experience to a close. And it was just fascinating history and really enjoyed it. If you can, if you can say you enjoyed it, because it's kind of somber. Yeah. You know, yeah. Dallas is known for this tragic event. Exactly. And there was talk of demolishing buildings and things, the book depository they wanted to demolish. Yeah. Right and they just wanted to put the past behind them, eventually they, they came to their senses and said, we need to preserve this and share it with the public. So. Well, I remember it well. And also remember very well the, uh, the funeral that was yeah. uh, done in Washington, D.C., you know, with a horse-drawn caisson and so on. Yeah. It was uh, quite, a, quite an event. Yeah. And it was uh, amazing to just to see history taking place. Yeah. Now, based on what you know, the facts and everything, do you have any conclusions? Was it a lone gunman? Or, you know, they say that Kennedy had a lot of enemies from the mob to uh, the CIA, to Cuba. Um, what are your thoughts? Lone gunman or? I, I think it was lone gunman. I, and, and I think the uh, Warren Commission kind of came out with that same conclusion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you always have these people that come up with these fantastic theories yeah. you know there's all kinds of you know <laughs> collusion taking place and yeah. you know there was even a theory that uh you know that that he and johnson didn't didn't get along right. very well and, and of course, johnson, johnson was a had, texan so right and yeah. so there was a, a kind of a theory there that johnson might have some, something to yeah. do with it so there was all kinds of stuff going on at the time yeah i'm like you i, I believe it was a lone gunman history has a long list of lone gunmen from john wilkes booth to uh, Hinckley, who shot Reagan, right. to Chapman, who shot John Lennon. Uh, I don't know why people would be surprised that a lone gunman can pull this out because there's been a long history of it. Yeah. I think what leads to these conspiracy theories is that the D Dallas Police Department at the time botched the investigation. They mishandled evidence. Yeah. Uh, and anytime things don't quite add up, you say conspiracy, conspiracy, Absolutely. conspiracy. Um, but I'm with you. I, I believe that Oswald just wanted to make a name for himself and be remembered yeah. and uh, did it himself. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty I'm, I'm convinced that that's probably what happened. Yeah. Because, you, you, you know, there is there's really never any other proof of what 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 really happened right it's all speculation and it was no proof that there was anybody you know up on the not grassy knoll and all these other things that were going on yeah it was so i think the i think the warren commission probably did the right thing yeah you know and, and people say well jack ruby silenced oswald well when you look at the facts ruby was using uh, uh like western union or something to to send money to a worker of his minutes before he killed oswald if this was a planned event, why would he be carrying his dog around, sending money through Western Union, yeah. and then casually walks over to the police department and just happens to encounter Oswald as he's exiting? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, that just doesn't add up. Right, uh, right. Joe, we're getting to the, kind of the, it's towards the end of our, our time here, but uh, this has been fascinating. And, yeah, and your trip, you know, you take the most, the, the best trip. <laughs> you know, you come up with it with all these great, great, uh, great ideas and great trips. Well, thanks, and like I said, because it's the 60th anniversary, this trip was extra special, and you're going to be seeing some new documentaries on television. And, That's right. Uh, Multi-part. Uh, I I'm always watching every year when there's an anniversary. I watch the documentaries. I always learn something new, and it was nice to finally see these locations and and breathe that air and, and yeah. witness that history. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Sure, it's thanks been for having me. It's been fascinating just to listen to and see where you've been and all of the things that you've done on yeah. this particular trip. I, I need to go back. There, I've been learning a lot more and uh, I, I need to go back. Well, like you say, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of documentaries taking place exactly. since it's, a, what's the 60th anniversary? 60th anniversary, November 22nd. It goes by fast when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Thanks for having me.